They represent the very best and the worst of our past. Historical figures cast in bronze, stone, even gold sometimes. But when a statue commemorates a time and a vision that is no longer acceptable, should it be torn down? Or is it important it stay as a reminder? Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. You're watching Round Table, I'm glad to say. Statues of historical figures, well, they're very often divisive. One country's view of events, well, it often differs wildly from another, depending on which side you perhaps fought on. In a democratic society, shouldn't we be leaving monuments to history where they can stand so we can perhaps face up to our past? <laughs> Around the world, statues, buildings and street signs have become flashpoints for protest. To some, they celebrate important figures of the past. To others, they are reminders of a cruel and brutal time. So when reputations crumble, should monuments also fall? Or are they best consigned to history? It started where activism often does, at colleges and universities. Becoming a bigger global debate when a statue of Cecil Rhodes was toppled at the University of Cape Town in 2015. Rhodes was a British diamond magnate, white supremacist and colonial politician who helped engineer the policies of apartheid. Students in the United Kingdom made similar attempts to remove his presence from Oxford University where he was once a student and patron. Times have changed, um, attitudes have changed, and I think it would be better for them to take it down now. In the United States, there's an ongoing battle over Confederate symbols from a time of slavery. In August, protesters tore down Civil War soldier Silent Sam at the University of North Carolina. Since 2015, more than 100 Confederate symbols have been removed, mainly in the South. In other places, monuments teeter because of debate over ideology or imperialism. Statues of Lenin have been dismantled by those rejecting communism, most recently in Ukraine, which outlawed Soviet symbols. At times, monuments are also the focus of international and diplomatic spats. Osaka just ended its sister city relationship with San Francisco because of this statue representing the sex slaves of Japan during World War II. And in countries with a colonial past, men memorialised as pioneers are often viewed very differently by indigenous communities who see them as symbols of repression. We need to first of all be honest about our history and respectful to our first peoples. We cannot allow a statue of Captain Cook to remain asserting that he discovered this continent. But if protests to remove statues aren't successful, one alternative is to add further historical context. If you don't change the engraving, nobody knows or understands what happened beforehand. All they know is, is what's displayed and that may not be an entire truth. Others think erecting more memorials to commemorate a broader range of individuals and events is a way to appease both sides. Debate over monuments is part of a larger question about how the past shapes the present and the future. Despite being set in bronze or stone and built to last, they don't always endure. But does removing monuments pave over a shared history? And is any statue safe? Now let the conversation begin. Joining us on Skype, I'm pleased to say, in Paxton, that's just over the border from England into Scotland, we have Bruce Baker, lecturer in Modern American History. From Cambridge, we have Richard Drayton, Rhodes Professor of Imperial History at King's College London, and we'll talk about Rhodes as the conversation continues. Here at the Round Table, Professor Karen Lang, Associate Professor in the History of Art at the University of Warwick, and Sophia Cannon, political commentator and barrister. Sophia, first of all, why does it matter at all? Our smallest political spaces are the public squares, and even smaller than that, for example, are our currency or our stamps and who is represented upon those matters. Yeah, but why would you be offended by a statue somewhere? Why would anybody be offended by a statue rather than simply reminded of whatever good or bad things have taken place? 
the whole issue is that people venerate, people lionise those figures. These aren't just figures of history. They represent something, usually a, a win, a victory over another political change. These are a, a, a paradigm uh, statues to a time and a place which we venerate, which we want to remember. And the remembrance in and of itself comes every time you pass it, mm. every time you see it, and every day you are in that public space. Mary, Mary Beard says, Karen, um, that we should look history in the eye, not Photoshop it. And surely if we take these things down, that to some extent is what we're actually doing, rather than confronting our past. Yes, I think Not necessarily that's... venerating it, as Sophia says. No, I think that's right, and I agree with Sophia that certain things are commemorated, not others. And that these cont contentious statues offer us an opportunity to come to terms with the past. And I think they provide the chance for a public reckoning. I don't think they should be torn down until that public reckoning has taken place. How do you know when that's happened? Well, Sophia mentioned the public sphere. I think that's a good place to start. I think we need a robust public sphere that can talk about these and, and see in each case will be different. Richard, Richard Rhodes Professor. Now that in itself <laughs> is a name which is associated with an awful lot of what people associate as being bad with Britain's colonial past. Uh, the statue came down in South Africa, it didn't um, at Oxford, but perhaps it's time for you to ditch your title as we move on with this debate. Well, I think we've initiated steps towards considering how that might be done at King's. Uh, bureaucracies, however, take some time to work things through. What I would say is that a little bit more than 30 years ago, I was interviewed in Barbados for the Rhodes Scholarship, because I'm not just a Rhodes Professor, but a former Rhodes Scholar myself, uh, by a, a committee on which there was the Governor General, uh, a man called, called Sir Hugh Springer. He said, Springer said to me, well, Drayton, uh, you've been very much involved in the anti-apartheid movement. How can you now be seeking to take the money from Cecil Rhodes, to which I responded, uh, the money which went into the endowment of the Rhodes professorships did not come from Cecil Rhodes. It came from Africans who were driven as slaves in diamond mines and in gold mines to produce that wealth, which that robber baron then chose to attempt to launder his reputation through uh, creating various forms of charities. The point is that my obligations were not to Cecil Rhodes. My obligations were to those, in fact, who created that wealth. And the Governor General responds, he says, yes, of course, there's an old Barbadian proverb, if you teeth from a teeth, God smile. Um, now, uh, I didn't hear that tradition. properly. If you do what? If, if you teeth. teeth. If you steal from a thief, God smiles, is the translation. I get it, okay. Uh, and uh, the point is really that we are in a transitional moment in global history, uh, with the end of the European empires, with the kind of overthrow of the kinds of assumptions of white supremacy on which modern cosmopolitan society was organized in the 20th century uh, until the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and that we're in the midst of a kind of gradual uh, healing uh, and transformation of our world uh, in the after aftermath of a couple of centuries of horror. Now, the point is that this idea that statues have some perpetual right to remain where they are. Now, that's a very different from saying the statues have a right to survive. What has happened throughout human history, whether we're talking about ancient Rome, which Mary Birch known a bit more about before she spoke, uh, uh, or indeed uh, in uh, uh, revolutionary United States uh, after they, they won, or in revolutionary France, 1780s or 1830s, 1840s, 1870s, uh, or indeed in, uh, even up to March in Barcelona. Uh, what happens is that people choose to remake the public space because the public space is a space held in common, in which the values of democracy are represented. Uh, and it's a different business. It's not a question of destroying these statues. One moves them, as they did in India, when India became independent. Condoleezza Rice says to move these things, to take them down, is to sanitise history. Bruce, uh, to some extent, she's got a point, I think, hasn't she? Well, I think, uh, it's, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding here and a lot of conflation of history and the past, right? So there's an idea that by moving a statue or taking down a statue that we somehow do violence to history. But actually history is something that's rewritten all the time continuously as we get new sources of information or we decide there are new questions we want to ask. We can't change the past, but we can and continually change history.
and these statues existed as particular moments in history. Uh, there's a, a scholar who named uh, Jim Lowen who has a really clever formulation of this, that a statue always tells us about three different periods in of time. It tells us about the event that's being depicted, it tells us about the moment when the statue was put up, and it tells us about the present when we're looking at the statue. And every time, really every, every day that we have a statue, we're making an affirmative decision to keep that statue. But the point that um, Richard made, Sophia, was that um, to some extent it, it, it's not money he's taking from roads, it's money he's taking from people who made money for roads, therefore remembering them. And when you have a statue, let's say, of Cecil Road, it is remembering those people, it's commemorating those people who perhaps suffered at that person's hands. Indeed, indeed. Well, would that it were? OK, Richard, sorry, I'm, I'm throwing that one at Sophia, but I mean, I think that was the gist of the point you made, that when you decided to take a Rhodes scholarship, you were not, a Rhodes professorship, you were not taking it because of the name of Rhodes, you were taking it in honour of those people who had perhaps helped Rhodes get where he was. I think that's that, what you that, said. Yeah. That is what I said. That, that, however, is not what the statue in the public place is saying. OK, let's hear what Sophia let's has to say there. Well, like you, well, I'm a daughter of empire, so I'm partly Caribbean. And it's been very interesting to note over the course of my lifetime that finding out my heritage um, that indeed on the slave owners database I found my original um, ancestor. And what was crucial to find out was who owned our family. And knowing that I represent so much of the best of her hopes and I should be in my public space and feel free to move around in it. And going back to that as well, it's very different having a, um, a statue of Rhodes in Africa and Rhodes on a building on the side of Oxford. It's where that uh, statue is situated and what it represents. Mm -hmm. Because in Africa, I see a statue of Rhodes as being very much an affront to African nationalism, the freedom and indeed the whole uh, movement of, of African centralized, um, centralism. But in, in, in Oxford, it means a whole different thing. What does it mean in Oxford? Because his philanthropy, as uh, Richard quite rightly said, was laundered, it was sanitised, it was very much a mere culpa of, of his legacy. And he, at the end, and he, the trustees of that uh, foundation saw fit to try and clean it and sanitise it. And quite frankly, I would take that money and run uh, and do what I had to do to, to ensure that my ancestors, on whichever side of the Atlantic I, I am talking about, have that ability to be represented in this okay. century. How does it differ, Karen? And we, we can all kick in on this. So please don't feel that you've got to wait until mm. I ask a question. Mm. How does it differ? removing, perhaps consigning to a dark room somewhere, getting rid of a particular work of art that represents something that you don't like to what Isis did at Palmyra? How is it different? Well, again, I would say that was an incredible act of, of violence. Um, to I'm not talking remove about those to the people, statues. I'm simply talking about to the statues. No, to the statues, yeah. absolutely, destroying yeah. those. And again, I would say it's about a loss of opportunity to engage in a dialogue about what these statues represent. And here I go back to Bruce's point. I think the monument was commemorated, the statue was commemorated as a reminder. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it remind us of? What is, what is the purpose of it for us today? And raise a dialogue. And I wonder, Bruce, this reminds me of um, University of Virginia. And I think there, that was a university started by Thomas Jefferson in 1819, who was a slave owner. He had more than 600 slaves during his lifetime. There's a statue of Thomas Jefferson on campus. There was a lot of debate recently about whether that should stay. But then that created an openness in history to engage with that slave-owning past, to engage with with the enslaved workers who had created the University of Virginia. And in 2017, they, there was a community dialogue with the architects and who created then a, a monument to the enslaved laborers of the University of Virginia, which sits just, just next to the rotunda 
um, that celebrates Thomas Jefferson. So to my mind, that's a very good example of how a past was not erased. It's been acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And those voices, to get back to Sophia's point, who were lost to history, yes. are now have a presence. Who decides? And there's a dialogue. Who decides that it's something that is um, not in the public interest, not in everybody's interest? Because that's an entirely subjective view. Richard, we haven't heard from you for a little while. Um, who has a right well, to say and make these decisions? Well, I, I actually want to rewind us just ever so slightly uh, to talk about vo voices that were silenced. Because what we need to remember is that when these contentious statues were put up, they were contentious even in their own times. So, for example, take, take the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oxford. At the time that was put up, uh, Rhodes was an enormous disrepute within Oxford. Uh, when the, the proposal was made to give him an honorary degree, uh, virtually 100 ac academics, all the most prestigious members of the university, signed a petition saying that we can't give this person an honorary degree. Uh, so in other words, they're the voices of contemporaries who were outraged at this person being honored as silence. Again, if we look at the United States, those Confederate statues of Robert E. Lee, etc., most of them were actually put up in the early 20th century as part of the recreation of Jim Crow. They were linked to the politics mm -hmm. of... Uh, of, of white supremacy as it was being created in the early 20th, 20th century. Uh, they weren't vestiges of some kind of mid 19th century uh, Southern lost cause sympathy. So there was a politics which at the time, which had to do with power silencing a variety of contemporary voices. So to move a statue from the public place <coughs> to a museum, not necessarily into a dark place as David was suggesting. But it, it, but it is subjective, it is subjective. I, I think you'd like to hear the views of a guy called Michael Thurmond. Um, he's on the board of the group that looks after Stone Mountain in Georgia. It's north of Atlanta, and there, rather like sort of um, Mount Rushmore, there is a yes. carving of three mm -hmm. Confederate soldiers carved into this rock. It, it is massive. And he said, a lot of people said it should come down, he says, it proves that the South was a failed experiment in white supremacy, and it teaches this generation and the next uh, how movements based on racism, on bias, prejudice, are ultimately defeated. He's African-American. He thinks that is the lesson we should learn from that. There are a variety of options which are open to curators, uh, both of works of art and of public spaces. Uh, that represents one path. Uh, in some cases, there's the option to move the statue to another place. But certainly there is a possibility of rather more energetically uh, uh, curating the object. So one, one indeed does attempt to presence the silence voices uh, of various other historical periods. You see, the thing is, um, and we've got to move this around, the, the thing is, with something like that carved into um, a rock face, Bruce, um, the only thing you can do is to do a Palmyra on it. You, you've just got to destroy it. Or a I think that I think there's uh, an argument to be made that one one way, and I think this is perhaps uh, part of what Karen is suggesting, that we keep the monuments in place, but we add further information, a sort of plaque explaining the context yeah. mm -hmm. of when they were built. I think the question with Stone Mountain particularly is, how do you do that? It's huge. <laughs> I think it's actually bigger than Mount Rushmore. Um, I think it's you know, by the you same put a plaque on the well, actually. Yeah, if, if you put a plaque on the side of the mountain, nobody's going to see it. So. There's always the possibility of adding a sculpture in. So if we are actually honoring the past and keeping that and so forth, why don't we put Martin Luther King right Frederick there next Douglas. to it? He's Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King. Well, this right is there what they've done the with the, the, the guy who was a, a, a big donor to Bristol, Colston. Yes. Yeah. They put a plaque there saying this man was a slave owner. Learn, learn that from it. <laughs> learn from it. And I, again, it goes back to this idea of revising history to ensure that the, the, the monuments going forward know what we were thinking. I think this is what you were saying at this time. It's an edit button for our, our social media. This is the equivalent of saying, hold on a minute, back then we thought this, now we have more information, we now think this. And another way uh, of looking at these, this issue of our, how our private feelings are reflected in our public space. I mean, today I just heard that there's going to be a Brexit coin. So it's how... Won't be worth much. <laughs> it's the 50 pence. <laughs> uh, and, and the whole idea is it's how, you know, perhaps we could ameliorate this, what I would call almost like a savage affront of these uh, statues sort of piercing our public spaces. Why not name the squares, the roads leading up to? Or well, the roads leading up to yes, roads. Yes, no, the, the roads leading up to roads. But renaming these libraries, renaming these scholarships, 
after the plantations, after the people, and after these silent voices. And I think it's quite crucial for us to, to reassess. You're on a carousel, though, aren't you? I mean, if you don't like it and get it changed, what about the next person who doesn't like the fact that you didn't like it and gets it changed, and so on and so on and so on? Well, we've always... Is that a problem? I, I don't personally see it as a problem, because it's, it's a living history, then. Well, I think history has to be living. You know, uh, just as tradition should be living, and they can and be justice. remade in the present. Um, if we, you know, there's the famous saying, if we don't learn from the past, then what? Yes. You know, or the, the American novelist William Faulkner said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. And I think that's true. So all of this gives us a chance to remake, to learn from the past and to remake our, our history now. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity, I would say, but I, it should come with a public conversation. Yeah. yeah. OK, Bruce, I mean, are, these, are we talking about snowflakes here, people who just sort of don't like <laughs> something and, you know, would rather it went away? No, I don't think so. Uh, as Sophia and, and others have pointed out, these statues went up at a particular time. And as, as Richard was saying, the monuments to Confederate soldiers in the United States South tended to go up between roughly 1890 and the 1920s. The really early monuments to the Confederate dead went in cemeteries, which is where you'd expect them. And it's only at that period in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, that you start seeing monuments dominating public space, particularly courthouse squares. So you have a Confederate monument immediately next to the place where the seat of local government is, where African Americans are uh, facing trial in the courthouse and so forth. This is all about reinforcing a certain view of who's important in society at a time when the southern states were making it illegal for African Americans to vote. <clears throat> but at the same time, they were taxing them. So in a lot of cases, these monuments go up with black tax money and white tax money. What um, would you do? In a decision that they had no voice in deciding. OK, let's just kick this one around, because we don't have very much longer, I'm afraid to say. What would you do in somewhere like Rome, where every step you take, you're standing on something that represents a well, in, enlightened in some way era, but also an extremely repressive era when people were taken advantage of, they were made to fight for their lives, they were slaves, they were put in galley ships, and yet every, you can't remove the entirety of Rome, can you? No. I mean, the closest thing that we have is Nazi Germany. Don't forget, within 15 years, Hitler had managed to remodel the public space, reinforce his own idea of what architecture should be and impose upon every type of uh, physical ergonomic uh, um, uh, structure the Nazi symbol. And then, as soon as the war ended, the decommissioning, the removal of these symbols was very much part of what it meant to be free and to have a sense of justice. And we need to realise that that was a, a very quick way to impose your view and your politics on the population without its permission. And I think we have to say, like we, like we do need to have these ongoing conversations with ourselves, with the next generation, and notwithstanding uh, the generation that's just <laughs> left that political space. Yeah, there, there's a historian ongoing conversation called Madge Dresser. She says they're lightning rods yes. for yeah. history. Without yeah. But, well, but I suppose but what they, I'm saying, they, when, when bringing up Rome there, what I'm saying is you can go too far, can't you, yeah. Karen? But, but oh, they, 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 well, David, second, David, if I could interject here quickly. One second. Uh, yeah. let, let me just put this one to Karen, then I'll come to you. Um, yes, I think you, you can. You can go too far. I think you can go too far, and I think with the Rome example, it's, it's useful maybe to remember the, the Roman in the uh, statue Pascolini, which was just a little statue of, of a man, but people used to pin their... Um, points of debate on this statue. So it was a living statue. It was a statue in the public sphere. If you disagreed with something, you put that on there. And I think that's what we need for statues to also be alive, not just our debate. And so we could have artist interventions with the statues. We could have public debate around the statues so that history stays alive and we can learn from it. In Richard, the quick thought as we come towards the end. Yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a qualitative difference between ancient Rome and its relationship to the present uh, and statues which honor white supremacy in the American South. 
in a, in a society in which blacks are still categorically unequal in so many different ways. And the same is true, it has to be said, in a place like Oxford, in which you still have college porters who will, one or two years in, still not recognize that black students actually belong to the college and have the right to cross the threshold. So the politics of race, to the extent that they're connected to, uh, to both historic white supremacy uh, and statues, gives this whole statue question slightly more of a bite than it does with respect to statues in ancient Rome, of ancient Rome. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, final thoughts, Sophia? Well, I hope I'm going to have grandchildren that see their faces reflected in the statues that they come across when they go to college. Listen, thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, also for your contribution to this. Um, and thank you to Karen, thank you to Sophia, thank you to Richard. Thank you for watching this edition of Brown Table. Stimulating debate. We've been talking about stimulating debate. It has been a stimulating debate, fascinating subject. And the one that, uh, well, it might not go down in history because of what it is, but it'll go down in history because of what we've been talking about. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching and from the team, goodbye. Hope to have your company next time.